Today's focus is really getting to the root of being intentional about what you do in your small group setting. So before we jump into small group, can I just get like a hand raise of what grade level you teach? Just like first grade? Okay, so we've got a pretty big mixture. And the challenge was in coming up with this, first grade small group instruction looks completely different than fifth grade small group instruction. So that presented us with a pretty big challenge. So I hope that what the other coaches that are presenting at Centennial, we came together and came up with this um, PowerPoint presentation. So hopefully, whatever grade that you teach, you'll be able to take some of these ideas and apply it to your classroom small group instruction. So looking at our outcomes for this session for today, really it's two actionable things. For you to be reflective about what you're doing in your small group instruction, and then hopefully to identify a couple of new influences or factors that you can take back and apply to your small group instruction right now. And I'll use those two words, influences and factors interchangeably, but they have the same meaning for what we're doing today. We're gonna look at a couple of quotes that really get to the root of why small group reading is important in everything that we do in our classroom. We'll touch back on the Williamson County Reading Initiative. We'll look at some current research, how that is applicable to what you do in your small group. You'll have some opportunities to collaborate with the people in here. And then hopefully we'll have enough time on the tail end for you to do some thoughtful planning springboarding into this spring session, utilizing some of the ideas that we talk about today. Any questions about that agenda? All right. So if you'll just take one to two minutes and read through these two quotes, please. <coughs> So when I read through these two, the two things that really stood out to me the most were building a network of strategic action. When you're pulling a small group, what you're doing is providing your students with the tools, the strategies, and the skills that they need to walk away from your table and read a text independently on your own. So I really think that um, statement there applies to that. And then the other thing in the second quote that I thought really stood out was the skillful teacher. You can't have an effective small group without you. You are the skill that's being brought to that group to really get the biggest bang for the buck in the smallest amount of time. Now I have one more slide of two more and we don't have to read through those but I'll just point out the precise teaching that goes back to that intentionality being purposeful about what you're planning what you're doing in your small group and then the second quote again it goes back to you being that skilled teacher facilitating that small group setting so I show these quotes to remind you that the number one predictor about what impact student achievement is your collective teacher efficacy it's your belief that what you're doing every day is meaningful and produces those results. And this will allude to some of the research that we'll talk about later that will springboard some of the conversations that we'll look at. But the statement down here at the bottom, and I know it's in white print and hard to read, but I just want to read it to you. It says, a school staff that believes it can collectively accomplish great things is vital for the health of a school and if they believe they can make a positive difference, then they very likely will. So we talk all the time with our students about keeping that growth mindset about what it is that they're doing. And we can't forget that we have to have that same growth mindset about what we're doing every day with our students. So with Williamson County continuing to grow every year, adding new teachers with vast experiences and expertise, expertise PD days like this are great opportunities to kind of reset our focus for this upcoming semester. And it's really important for us educators to stop, reflect, and then recharge what our purpose is with our students every day. So with that being said, it's important for us to be reflective and think about what that Williamson County Reading Initiative is. And this is just a quick little overview of what that expectation is. You've got your 90 minute literacy block. You've got 30 minutes designated to your whole group instruction where you're working 
in grade level content within your scope and sequence. And then you see the majority of your time should be spent every day doing small groups. And what I like about this little visual here, if you're a fifth grade teacher, you may not always be thinking about what your students were doing in kindergarten. And if you're a first grade teacher, you may not be thinking about, oh my gosh, when they get to fifth grade, what's their main focus? But the piece to look at here is the continued arrow here at the bottom. Regardless of what grade level you're teaching, you're charged with interactions within the text and building students' text comprehension. But when you look at your K and one, you gotta think about your critical content first. If you're a kindergarten or a first grade teacher, Every day your critical content is rooted in phonics. And you're not going to move on in that small group setting until phonics is accurate and automatic, meaning they can decode it, they can read it quickly. Then when you're moving into your second grade band, you're doing a, a balance between comprehension and phonics. And the phonics there may be rooted more in just making sure that that fluency piece is really strong. Because if you're an upper grades teacher, you know that a struggling reader that's spending all of their time decoding is never going to get to the understanding of what it is that they're reading. So that foundational piece is where your lower elementary really comes into play. And then if all of this is done, then you're hopefully the majority of your students are going to be able to spend that third, fourth, and fifth grade time really digging in to the text that they're reading. And within the Williamson County Reading Initiative, we're looking at the majority of your small group time is being spent in a text. Your kids are reading it. Your kids are discussing it. And based on the skill level of your group, you may have some kids who need to practice reading out loud. You may have some higher readers that can do that independent reading within their head, and you're just facilitating the conversation at the table. So. You know, you just kind of have to be, again, thoughtful and intentional about what you're doing in that small group setting there. Any questions about that? Okay. So, moving into the research piece, is anyone in here familiar with John Hattie? Okay. I'm not a Hattie guru. I know a little bit about him, and I know he's got some good research. So, when we were putting this presentation together and thinking about how we can bridge phonics in first grade to complex close reading text in fifth grade, we really liked the Hattie research and how it really supports what you do in the classroom. So just two sentences about Hattie. He's an educational researcher and he's done years of research on those factors and influences that show the greatest impact on student achievement. And when he was looking at all of this information, he posed the question, what works best in education? And what he did, he started with 138 influences, and now I think there may be over 200, 250. And he ranked them according to their effect size. And he found that the average effect size was a .40, and anything above that he linked to having a positive, um, a positive effect on student achievement and anything below that had a negative effect. And these aren't just influences for a literacy classroom. It's not just influences in an elementary classroom. It's just talking about education in general. So we went through and came up with 14 that we thought were the most impactful for what you use and do in small group instruction. So the first thing that we're going to do is you're going to, on this sheet here, I've got listed 15 different influences. If you'll just mark off the strategy monitoring one, we're not going to talk about that one today. But if you will, when you get this paper on this front page, read through this list of 14. And I want you to rate yourself to what extent you're using these particular strategies in or influences in your small group right now. One meaning you don't do it at all or you very rarely do it. And five meaning that you do it every day and you feel like you do it pretty well. So if you'll take about three minutes to quietly reflect on that. All right, when you finished rating yourself, the second step is for you to circle the three factors that you think have the greatest effect size. The third step again was breaking up into groups of three or four and then taking those factors there and just talking through if you were using these particular strategies during a small group lesson, would it fall in those pre-reading sets would it be something that you would use while you're actually reading the text with the students? Or would it be a, a, a skill or a strategy that you would use on the tail end? And um, what you're going to find is 
there may be some that fall in all three categories, and that's okay. That would sh probably allude to the fact that it's got some type of strong effect on an impact on student learning there. So if you'll just kind of, like I said, get together in those groups, and then I'll give you about three to four minutes to just talk through that together. All right, just for time purposes, I'm going to move on. So the next slide here shows those 14 influences, what their effect size is, and then where we felt as literacy coaches they fell in a small group lesson. The great thing is that there's no right or wrong answer as to where each one of those are, but just cross-reference what you and your group were talking about. Look at the three you circled that you thought had the greatest effect. Which I, I thought that questioning down here with 0 .40 being the, the average, it's at a four, four point, or excuse me, a .48. It has a less effect size than providing feedback to your students, which I thought was interesting because I know within our evaluations, we think so much about the higher order questioning. But honestly, if you look at the research, the feedback that you're providing your students you know, live action in the middle, making those immediate feedbacks for them has more impact on their student achievement than the actual questioning. Is that the Hattie score? Yes, that's the Hattie effect, yes. Are these the top 14? They're not. So what we did is we looked at the .40 and above and just pulled out the ones that we thought were applicable to small group instruction. Because like I said, they cover education in general, not just elementary reading. And the collective teacher efficacy, the, the first slide that I showed you on that, was a 1.57 in comparative to these. Okay, so the next step in taking these 14 influences is looking at what do these really look like in action to, to you? Since we don't know if they're specifically teacher directed or student directed, if you were to go around and define what each one of these were, what would it look like in application in your small group setting? So around the room, we've got some posters with some of these strategies broken up. There's a two, three, 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 and three. So what I'd like for you to do for this step is to try to break up. You can use the same groups if you want to. Or we may have to get a little bit larger since there's I only have five posters, but maybe no more than five or six in a group. And with your poster, just bullet. What does that look like to you in small group? What would it look like in a first grade small group versus a fifth grade small group? And I've got prior knowledge up here as an example that might be introducing your vocabulary, connecting the text or a skill to a previous learning, or previewing the text to make connections. Um, so we will kind of share this out when we're done. So on this slide, up, or this poster up here, we've got prior knowledge, formative evaluations, and scaffolding. Someone that worked on this one, would you share out what you've got up there? Okay, so we have pulling past experiences for, um, related to the text, text connections, text to self, picture walks, previewing text, connecting the previous text, <laughs> Acting out vocab and playing password with vocab. Anybody have anything else that you could add to activating prior knowledge? I think it's a really important piece. <laughs> What's the effect size on that? 0.93. So I think when you're planning out your small group, don't let that part slide. Let that beginning piece be a, a big chunk of what you're doing there. When you relate it to their world, it yeah. means more to them. Mm -hmm. We there also like to try to get with our science and social studies teachers because mm -hmm. we don't teach that. Mm -hmm. We just start ELA at our school. And it's amazing when those kids are like, we read about this in science. Mm -hmm. You're like, I know. I have talked to that teacher. And it's just like, mm -hmm. even to have that little bit of a connection right. too, like it kind of. Mm -hmm. Well, and this kind of goes with learning goals. Um, but I find that students like to look at the, the standard from fourth grade and then see the difference between what they did last year and how it changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so it makes them think back the previous year, what they did with it, and then that kind of goes into the learning goal, then this right. is what we're going to yes. be doing. And I think it was your group that made the comment about 
how many of these kind of overlapped with each other. Something that you might do up here might be the same type of action that you do there. And I think when you really start to attack it that way and you look at the multi-levels of what happens in your small group, you do see that they really do overlap with each other. There's not just a skill or a strategy that you teach exclusively. Anything from formative evaluations and scaffolding? We have comprehension questions, verbal and written, fluency checks, reader's response, and differ differentiated assessments. Of course, we know that drives everything that we do, so that's the, the meat of it all. Ain't scaffolding. Um, we have varied questioning and strategies, modeling, level books, book clubs, and discussion groups. Anybody have anything to add to either one of those? Great, thank you. How about summarization, evaluation, reflection, and feedback? Anybody from this one that could share up for us? Um, well, for summarizing, restating the main idea and the key details in the books and the ideas that are important. Um, also, before you read, picture and text feature walks kind of can summarize the story mm -hmm. too. Um, close read, so just looking at the section and then partner reading. Like, I read a page, you read a page, and then we discuss before we move on. I think that piece is really valuable because especially your struggling readers have a hard time articulating what they've read. So if you're very purposeful about setting that step up, you're, you're really giving them the tools that they need to express what they've understood and read. All right, evaluation and reflection. Um, just discussion during reading, prompt, prompting them with questions and pointing out anything like as you're reading that they may have missed that was key to the passage. And then asking the open-ended questions. Um, and then exit tickets of, you know, any kind yeah. about what they've read. And I think that's one that would be, you could have a different category of actions for what it looks like from the teacher's perspective and then what it looks like from your student's perspective. And how about feedback, which had a pretty good effect size, 0.7. We kind of had a little bit of a discussion whether it was like, like, the teacher reflecting and thinking about mm -hmm. like giving ourselves feedback or if it was feedback from teacher to students so we thought about both ways that teacher or students can encourage each other mm -hmm. and give feedback to each other and um, using accountable talk stems so like when you're discussing I agree with you because mm -hmm. or I disagree with you because perfect anybody have anything else to add to those Great, thank you. All right, learning goals versus no learning goals, concept mapping, and metacognitive strategies. Anybody from that one that can share out for us? Um, well, we just kind of focused, I guess, on the learning goals rather than the no learning goals because we felt that was the positive point of that, but um, just stating objectives at the beginning, um, beginning with the end in mind. We mm -hmm. talked about like kind of letting the kids know right from the beginning what we hope for them to achieve by the end of our small right. group. Um, just kind of it sets the tone for the lesson. Um, it gives them a focus and like a measurable goal yeah. to what they can work on. With concept mapping, we talked about graphic organizers and just ways to organize their thinking. Um, definitely support for those visual learners mm -hmm. and it also kind of helps them see how different strategies can kind of be connected together. Mm -hmm. And I can't see the last one, Metacognitive. so somebody will take over there. <laughs> it says strategies, think aloud, comprehension, monitoring, connecting, questioning, explaining, thinking, annotation, and signposts. Which again, I think you see that things that are happening here could be happening there and these with that. So you really start to see the connection with the the lingo. Does anyone have anything to add to those? Great. All right, last one. It was time on task and questioning. Okay, we had um, for time on task, um, what it looks like is um, student engagement, some type of accountability, whether that be accountability checklist, sheet, some, I don't know, however you'd want that to look, um, an appropriate level task, um, chunking text, giving students roles within groups to keep them on task, um, seamless transitions, like, you know, bells or, or some type of signal, um, timers, um, fast finisher options, like people that finish early on, on and even in small group and they're finished and it's like, you know, um, differentiating the tasks, um, 
helps kids stay on task, more preparation of the materials, making sure that you have everything you need ready to go so you're not like trying to find this or that. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a materials person, then that would be something else. Routines and expectations, always going through those procedures, mm -hmm. routines, expectations, and that could take a long, long time. As you know, it can take many, many weeks, and but you just keep doing it and it eventually works. It's our um, sanity saver. It is, yes, it is, and it works. Um, quest for questioning, we said um, what that looks like is that you have pre-planned questions, um, not just like off the top of your head, but like actually going through that text, finding those questions and sticky noting or doing whatever you do to do that, having a lot of open-ended questions, um, scheduling time for questioning in classrooms, and we, um, you know, we talked a lot about how we don't have time to listen to kids and then talk or to talk, ask us things because we're like, okay, we have to go on to this now, and it's all very, and so it, it kind of, I don't know, I think there's going to be a paradigm shift, actually, I think it's going to kind of go back to letting kids talk a lot more, that's just me. Um, prior, prior knowledge and connections, um, student to student questioning, turn and like turn and talk, um, KWLs, focused, make the questioning focused and purposeful, um, have a central question like that essential question, we always go back to that, um, making sure that the kids understand verbiage in questioning and, and what that means and what a question is asking you. I have a lot of times when I feel like kids, you know, you'll they'll have a question and they totally miss the point because they don't understand what it, the question is asking. So making sure they understand those um, academic vocab words, um, restating the question in an answer. Perfect. So great. Anything to add to those? You know, for me, when I sit back and think, oh, you guys do all of this already. You're just putting it into get categories and looking at the intentionality behind it and thinking about maybe you don't need to spend so much time on the questioning piece because it's really not the biggest component of what you're looking for, but maybe you need to focus more on that scaffolding step there. So it, it should hopefully help you kind of reorganize and realign what it is that you're doing.